So this is all about innovation, but it's about innovation in the online, offline uh, space. And uh, therefore, in many ways, it's in the retail space, which most people don't really think of as particularly innovative. You, you think of you know, technology being the area of innovation. But retailing is actually an area where there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of new concepts, and, and they come and go. And uh, online, of course, is a major part of the innovation uh, that's been going on in retail for the last few years. And that's where most of the growth in the market is. But let, let's get started, and I'm going to set the stage, and then David's going to follow up with uh, more of the logic of some of this. So setting the stage, uh, online varies a lot by country, and the statistics are really incredibly inaccurate. Uh, I can give you uh, different percentages for online in the United States, varying from about 8% up to 15%, uh, depending on what source I use. Um, actually, the UK uh, is maybe the highest at about 12% of retail uh, being online. But the US is about 10, China 8, um, get to about 1% in Singapore, uh, less than 1% in the uh, Thai market. The Thai market is about a billion dollar retail market and about 1% of that uh, is online. And what you need for online to work are four things, really. First of all, you need a web infrastructure, which in some ways is the easiest part, I think. Um, then you need a, a payment mechanism. You need credit. You need debit cards. Um, you need uh, a delivery mechanism. And you need trust, which very often is missing, of course. But depending on the country, these various attributes may be underdeveloped or in the process of developing. And so you get very different levels of um, participation in the online market, depending on uh, the particular country that you look at. So what, what would you think would be the largest uh, online companies in the world? You know what the largest is? Yeah, Alibaba, right? <laughs> Number two? Yeah, Amazon. You guys are good. Uh, number three? No, you'll never get number three. Will you? No. Number three? Whoop. Tencent. You know, it, it could be Tencent, depending on how they define online. You're absolutely right. Uh, number three, if we think more in the retail environment. So Alibaba is number one. Um, because they're, they're huge in terms of selling merchandise. You know, uh, Amazon is number two. Uh, number three is, is Apple, which is, we'll talk more about that. Staples is kind of an interesting one. Maybe you wouldn't have anticipated that so much of, of uh, office supplies are actually moving online. Walmart has gotten in the market. And then if you move to different countries, you, you know, if you move into India, Flipkart is number one. If you move into Japan, it's Rakuten uh, is number one. And so we could explore uh, different, uh, different markets. Now, what's kind of interesting, so one of the first uh, major conclusions, and some of you are well aware of this, is that uh, the two are coming together. We talk about omni-channel. Offline, online, online are, are becoming, uh, it's very much the need for a uniform strategy uh, that you combine both online and offline. It, in some ways, the, the bottom part of this, you, you're, you know, you you know this, that the, the major retailers have gone online. So Harrods out of the UK, or Uniqlo out of uh, Japan, or Sunig, which is the largest uh, um, appliance, electronic uh, chain out of uh, China. Uh, they've all been going online. And you know, at, chain after chain in the uh, retail market, whether it's in clothing or electronics or whatever, has been going online. What in some ways is more interesting is that a lot of the online companies are going offline. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about Amazon going offline. That is, going into fixed uh, retail space, which wasn't necessarily anticipated. Or Apple has very much gotten into fixed retail space. Uh, or Alibaba just bought a major uh, clothing chain in the Chinese market. And then the question is, why are they doing that? And what are, what are they trying to achieve? And in some way, how are they going to combine uh, the online and the offline? So the, these, these two are coming together. Here's just one example of it, is, is Apple. Apple has created an ecosystem. 
They've got the online. They have the stores. Are they really stores or are they display centers? You can go into the stores or display centers. You can't necessarily buy things there. I mean, many things you can buy there. Or they may tell you, hey, you can look at it here. Now go order it uh, you know, online someplace else. Apple has created these beautiful uh, stores. Um, of course, when the CEO of Apple, as some of you may know, then uh, was hired at Penny's, J.C. Penny's in the States, to go do the same thing, uh, it turned out that was totally inappropriate for uh, the J.C. Penny downscale uh, demographic kind of market. But Apple uh, is an interesting example of creating this ecosystem, combining online and offline, uh, and thinking of this as a uniform way to go to market rather than separating the two. Um, and, and another uh, example, and what's happening today uh, in, in a good number of markets, is that the offline, that is the retail, is saying, hey, you can buy it online, and then you can pick it up in the store. So Macy's, which is the largest department store chain in the United States, uh, will encourage you, perhaps, to go online and then to go pick it up in the store. And of course, this is advantageous for them, because if they get you into the store, maybe you'll stay, maybe you'll go buy other things as well. So again, it's how do you combine the online and the offline in some kind of uniform uh, way of thinking about things. Uh, another example I could give you uh, is, uh, is Amazon. Uh, which has set up um, fulfillment centers or lockers. If you, for example, in the UK, you go into a supermarket, there will be a set of Amazon lockers. So I can order from Amazon and pick it up later that day at, this, uh, the, the, at, at a locker. Now, what's the advantage of that? Well, these days, people aren't home you know, for the delivery. And if they live in a city, you know, how are they going to get it? And so. Maybe they'd be willing to go to the supermarket, and maybe that's a better way uh, for Amazon to be able to deliver the product uh, to people. It, it's all coming together. It's omni-channel. And then the other uh, way I want to go is to play with the idea of pop-ups as another part of an omni-channel strategy. Have you all been to pop-up stores or pop-up restaurants? Yeah? Good experience? Or <laughs> you think pop-ups are here to stay? Is this a novelty? Is this a fad? Is this, is this, can this really be part of a strategy? Let, let me show you some examples of pop-ups, and let's think what the strategy might be, and then let's, let me conclude with, yeah? When you say pop-up, you mean ad hoc. ad hoc? It's ad hoc, right? It may last for a week. It may last for a month. In some cases, it might last for four or five months. And it may last in one location for a week, but then move and be in another location you know, the next week and the next week and the next week. And in that sense, is it really just a permanent strategy, even although we call it pop-up, it keeps moving around. Yeah. But, but are pop-ups basically a market trial without the focus group? They could be. They could be a market trial. That would be one of the major ways of using a pop-up would be as a test market. Absolutely. Right. So here's a, here's a, well, first of all, here's Amazon, eBay, and Warby Parker. And they're all uh, using pop-ups. Uh, so, but let me show you pictures. So here's Amazon. They've gone into uh, San Francisco, Sacramento, and they're moving into New York and some other markets. And these are pop-ups in the sense that they've signed le lease space for a very limited period of time. But is this the prelude to a more permanent retail fixed-based uh, strategy, right? And what are they doing? Well, they're experimenting with physical space for their Kindle and for their Kindle Fire to see if, if when people play with them and experience them, touch and feel, whether that might lead to uh, a greater sales momentum for these products. In general, they're not in this location. They're not selling these products. They're creating. Uh, perhaps they're creating a buzz. And in fact, very often in pop-ups, it could be a test market, but very often it's to create buzz. It's about brand building and um, trying to uh, accentuate the, the value of the brand in the market. So this is Amazon doing pop-ups. Um, here is Warby Parker, which David's going to talk about. So Warby Parker uh, goes into uh, a yurt, uh, 
uh, had yellow school buses running around. And in Warby Parker's case, the pop-ups, at least initially, were a prelude to then signing leases for fixed space, which they have now done. So it might be as they go market by market, you start with pop-ups, and then you can move to fixed space. But again, you're testing the market to see what the value is of having the, uh, the fixed space. Uh, obviously, they also find that, hey, you know, there's a real value when people can touch and feel and see how they look and so forth. So Warby Parker is selling glasses online. Out of Japan and into the Thai market, into Bangkok here, we have Line. Line is a, a chat app. And um, they uh, have come into, uh, gone into pop-ups and are actually selling their emoticons, uh, these cute little figures, you know, very Japanese. It's sort of like a Hello Kitty, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, all, they've got all these, these cute little figures. So in this case, um, these are part of the chat app. It's a major chat app in, in Asia, a little bit in other countries of the world. And these are cute little figures. They come into Bangkok and they're selling these cute little figures for a couple of weeks. So, you know, again, what are they doing? Well, they're trying to create buzz, trying to create excitement, trying to get everyone to run down and, and buy the emoticon where, when it's on sale for just a couple of weeks. An interesting one is Ikea, which is also in Bangkok. So, you know, a typical Ikea store is huge, right? How many of them can you build? How many can you build in Bangkok? At the moment, there's one. They're going to build a second one. And so how do you get people to go to this one store? And how do you create the right kind of excitement about uh, the IKEA concept? And how do you teach people about the IKEA concept? So they go into pop-ups. And in, with these pop-ups, it's trying to explain the concept. You can't buy anything at this pop-up. It's explaining the concept, get people interested in IKEA, and hopefully they'll then go to the major IKEA store, which is located someplace else in, in Bangkok. Uh, here's Kate Spade with uh, an igloo kind of thing in, in Bryant Park in, in New York. Now, Kate Spade has taken this strategy much further. And so this one was open for a week. But they've also gone into other retail space in New York as an experiment. And you can uh, actually order this stuff and get it delivered that day. You can't walk away with it. But you can uh, go into the store and you can you know, punch in what you want and it will be delivered uh, later that day. So it's getting more distribution. It's uh, uh, maybe, again, creating, uh, building a brand, creating buzz. This is a real simple one. This is a seasonal pop-up. And so you could think of uh, this is you know, maybe it, uh, Christmas, or it could be Ramadan, or whatever. And you have uh, a store that exists only for a month or less, and it is uh, then going to go out of business because, for the most part, you can't sell this stuff for the other 11 months of the year. Uh, so this is Harry and David. Uh, here's the Beatles. The Beatles were releasing a pack of vinyl records. Why, I don't know. And <laughs> this bus drove around New York to different locations. Why? Well, I think it's all about, hey, can we create buzz? Can we get media coverage? Can we get PR out of this? And based on that, can we sell a bunch of these Beatles uh, albums? I don't even know where you buy a, a, an album these days. Where would you buy an album? I don't know. There's, you, yeah, you'd go to a used something. I don't know where you would get one. And just a couple of others. Th this one is kind of interesting, too. This is Comme de Garçon. Um, this is a, a gorilla store concept. And a gorilla store is that in some ways, it's going after millennials, and it's countercultural. And you say, we're not going into the flagship store business, and we're not going to have big, expensive real estate. In this particular case, they're in Singapore in a location, I, I don't know where it is. It's not Orchard Street, and it's, you know, it's not going to be Fifth Avenue or whatever. So they go into a second or third tier location in multiple cities, and they're there for a limited period of time. And they're, they're trying to create a brand identity, trying to create buzz, trying to create excitement. And they're trying to go after a different part of the market, I, I think, unless the whole market starts moving this way. You know, are flagship stores dead? Yeah, I don't think so. Probably not. But flagship stores may be a certain part of the market. And these guerrilla stores may then begin to serve uh, another part of the market. Here's uh, a Thai restaurant uh, out of Bangkok, actually, Balong 
which goes into New York and uh, goes into you know, space next to, I can't remember where it is. And so then again, you wonder, what are they doing in New York in a pop-up restaurant? And it may be a prelude to saying, will this work? Will this concept uh, be of interest to people in, the, in New York, in the United States? And then they would move toward uh, fixed physical space. So maybe a test market. And we could go on. This is a, a mall of pop-up stores uh, outside London. And so there are you know, 50 pop-ups, and they come and go every week or two. People flock there for, uh, for what's new that week. And so what does all of this mean? Well, I think what it means is there are multiple uh, pop-ups, and maybe one categorization would be along the following lines. One is a sort of seasonal, you know, that, hey, I'm only here for a month or so because it's a certain time of the year where I can sell merchandise, and then I can't sell that merchandise the rest of the year. You could do the same thing in some ways for bathing suits, swimming costumes, you know. You could open a store that's good for a couple of months. People buy swimsuits just before the season begins. The rest of the year, good luck selling them. So that's seasonal. Flash is my whole purpose is to create buzz. And so for the, the Beatle bus driving around, it's all about can I create excitement? Can I create buzz? Can I get media coverage? And will that help me to uh, sell the, that particular product? Um, the idea of, of, of trying to sell a concept or explain a concept is something like uh, IKEA. Uh, so the, the IKEA concept may be new to a certain market. Can I use pop-up stores to be part of explaining the concept and to get people to go to the major uh, location? And then the gorilla concept, I'm not sure what I do with that. I think it's interesting and I, I sort of I, I sometimes wonder if there's more there than just a, a millennial countercultural kind of thing. For example, I think in some ways people, and this is a tremendous generalization, people are tired of shopping, I, that there's a diminishing marginal utility, and that all uh, of the uh, shopping centers look exactly alike. So if I go into Bangkok, into one of the major uh, st uh, shopping centers, or if I go into you know, almost any market in the world, you know, Orchard Street in Singapore, et cetera, you know, it, it all looks the same. You don't know where you are. It's the same kind of thing in airports. The Bangkok airport is exactly the same as Sloan Street in London, or the same as Heathrow Terminal 5, which is the same as, as other major airports. And so you know, is, is, there, is there a factor where this wears out and that people will find it attractive to go countercultural? And you know, how big is that market? That's a question I throw out there. OK, let me, let me wrap it up. So why would you do this? Let, let me jump to the second one up there. That is the buzz, the brand building. So this is probably the major reason that companies do it. It's, it, it is about buzz. It is about building the brand. And in fact, it's difficult to show the sales value of these stores, at least if you're trying to sell something. It, it's difficult to show that they actually make money. Of course, it's difficult to show that you make money in a flagship store. If you were to look at all the stores up, up and down Fifth Avenue, the Pradas, the, uh, the Chanel's or whatever, they all lose money, right? What, what are they? Well, that's, tremendous. that's too much a generalization. <laughs> they don't all lose money, but they're in business not to make money. They're in business to, to accentuate the value of the brand and to get people familiar with the brand and wanting to go to, uh, um, wanting to buy that brand. So buzz and brand building are very important. It could be that you know, you're creating de deliberate shortage, and, and that, that would require a longer discussion. I think sometimes um, in marketing, we're too concerned with penetration. And in fact, we over-diffuse, we over-penetrate markets. And the greater the penetration in many product categories, not necessarily for a, convenience, a, a consumer convenience good, but the greater the penetration, the less value the product has. Right? I mean, if everyone, let me, let me give you an example of that. Well, the, first of all, there's a joke. Groucho Marx, uh, many years ago, said he wouldn't want to belong to a country club that would let him in. Right? You want, the hottest restaurant in London right now is Chiltern Firehouse. Well, that means I want to go there. Right? I don't want to go to some restaurant you can get in. Right? <laughs> And you, you know, you're walking, you know, we're walking around Bangkok looking for a restaurant. You'd never go to one where the 
looks empty. You know, you want to go to one you can't get into, right? So deliberate shortage, if you can manage that, can have some real value. Now that the luxury brand manufacturers are pretty good at that. You know, the Chanel's of the world will make sure that they manage uh, supply very, very carefully so that it doesn't lose value and become overly popular. So um, I think deliberate shortage is something it, uh, that deserves some thought. And pop-up stores are indeed deliberate shortage. You better go there this week, because it's only business this week. And the very fact that it's unavailable after the week, in and of itself, creates value, would be the idea. Not for everyone, but for a certain population. So we, we want to create deliberate shortage, perhaps. It could be for test marketing. We've got new, a new retail concept, or we've got new merchandise. And we want to see if, indeed, it would sell before we would roll it out further. So it could be for test marketing purposes. Um, a very simple one is you avoid fixed commitments. So as you're thinking perhaps of going into fixed-based retail, let's try it out without making fixed commitments to make sure it's going to work. And then we might be able to send, uh, willing to sign a long-term lease. So avoiding fixed commitments is another value here. And then finally, you could be using pop-ups to bluff to bluff your competitors. And so what you do is you create a store with merchandise which has nothing to do with what you intend to do. And you want your competitors to go into that store and look at that merchandise, especially let's say we're in a fashion market, and to think that that's what you're going to introduce. You have no intention of introducing that. Many people think that, oh, bluffing, why would you do that? You know, is it, is it ethical and so forth? Well, yeah, I think it's ethical. Um, if I can fool my competitors and if I can get them to move in a different direction than I actually intend to move, I, I think that indeed is worthwhile. So thank you.